Welcome to the future. My name is Taylor Cassidy Pauly. I'm a creator, innovator, and beauty activist. Almost every one of us have asked, how do I look? Or it could be, does my hair look weird? Do my eyebrows, are, are they unsymmetrical? Do my pores look huge? Or is there something in my teeth? Wait, no, seriously, is there something in my teeth? No? I'm good? Great. These questions are so prominent in our daily routine that we don't even remember when it all started. This reminds me of a time of when I was a camp counselor at a summer camp. A camper who was around 10 at the time came up to my colleague and I and said, I like you better, Taylor Cassidy, because you don't have that stuff on your face. In disgust, they pointed at my colleague's hormonal acne. I know what you're thinking. Wow, that kid is such a little. But all jokes aside, keep in mind that camper was young. We can say it was bad parenting, or maybe that they were a bad egg, but we can't. Research shows at the age of 12 months old, these biases show because we gravitate towards attractive people. What do I mean by attractive? Attractive people have consistent features like clear skin and facial symmetry, the basis behind the golden ratio. We seek attractive people because they make us feel better. Their aesthetically pleasing face leaves us no discomfort when we're with them. So we associate with what makes us feel good, with what is good. Attractive people tend to get labeled as kind, patient, trustworthy, and more for something they didn't earn, just something they were born with. Numerous works in evolutionary psychology pins attractive people as those who have physical characteristics of a good mate. Back then, clear skin and facial symmetry meant great health that we would want in our mate so our kids could have it too. Fast forward to today, where we have many more qualities to base our decisions on in a person. But even though we evolved, why didn't our decision-making processes on looks change with us? Why do we love quotes from Coco Chanel that say, beauty begins the moment you decide to be yourself? Yet belittle ourselves by taking dozens and dozens of pictures for one new profile photo, instead of being confident in taking the one. Why does this bias for attractive people still exist? And why can't we get rid of it? It's because we're scared. And also, it's subconscious. So we have very little control over it. So don't worry, you're not all bad people that I know of. I absolve you from your guilt. As humans, we were born with an exceptional mind. But sometimes our mind gets tired. So it uses mental shortcuts when we see someone for the first time, which leads us to think categorically. So we give people labels so it could save our mental energy. So when we see clear skin, we see healthy, asymmetrical eyebrows as questionable, or hormonal acne as just bad things we were conditioned to do since the beginning. And when I say we're scared, it's because we are. Every time we cover a zit, widen our smile, or align our eyebrows, we make a decision. A decision to conceal ourselves so that the judgmental shortcut doesn't catch us red-handed. We just don't want people to label us the wrong way. So, in the past few decades, we've been innovating better ways to conceal ourselves. But never did we ask, how can we fix this? How can we make our minds work for us, not against us, because of our looks? How can we better analyze the surface so we can see what's beneath it? 
Some of you may think that's just how life is, but actually it can be something more. We can train to use our mental shortcut in a much more meaningful way. It's like I'm Morpheus and all of you are the one. Today I'm here with my version of the blue pill or the red pill. The blue pill is for us to remain in ignorance of the power our mental shortcut has. The same shortcut that could decide if your friends are good employees, if your kids have potential, or if your partner deserves that job promotion, all because of their looks. Or there's the red pill, for us to remain in uncertainty of who a person is when we meet them for the first time. And for us to try to understand them, although we have and might have no rhyme or reason. This is not a commitment, you know, to ask them a hundred questions, you know, binge watch shows together, introduce them to your parents and your friends. No, it's not like that. But rather, it's a responsibility to at least try. So what do you choose? The red pill or the blue pill? If you chose the red pill, that's great. But if you chose the blue pill, well, this is awkward. I guess I'll check in with you all later. As for the red pill group, hello. I'd like you to try an exercise. Close your eyes and try to remember a moment where you met someone for the first time. You saw them and you didn't know what it was, but their vibe was kind of off. So you ghost them. But thanks to fate, you meet again. And after some time together, they were just the best person you've ever met. And you wonder why you thought otherwise. Or it could be worse. You can see a guy, you think they're great, but then you realize you're kind of just fixated towards maybe their nice skin or their really nice jawline. And then after that realization, you kind of see that they have a bad personality or maybe they're a little bit racist, or maybe <gasps> they don't like long walks on the beach. Okay, for me, that's like a no-brainer, but maybe that guy was a fraud, who knows. Either way, that's the work of the judgmental shortcut at play, otherwise known as heuristics. It causes us to see people in labels, which can be great sometimes, but can also kind of suck. It can suck, because most of us don't have the time or the opportunity to fix our faulty first impressions. Or some of us are so strongly manipulated by it that we can't even correct ourselves. And it's hard. And it's a lot of work to manipulate a process we consciously have no control over. But growing research in cognitive psychology brought me here so I can help you hack this type of thinking so we can promote more complex thinking, otherwise known as authentic, genuine understanding. This hack is the three R's. So when you're evaluating someone for the first time, there are two things at play. There's Mel, the mediator, and Mo, the moderator. In the background, we have our library of memories, associations, and emotions. Those get organized by Mel, the mediator. Mel does the categories and then ends up creating these labels. Those labels get sent to Mo, the moderator, our recall. Mo determines what first comes into our head when we see someone for the first time. So if we want to hack the negative outcomes of these mental processes, we have to mess with Mel and Mo. This leads up to our first star, Renew. So we have our library of memories, associations, and emotions that are organized by Mel. So our first option is to add feelings of good and moments of great associated with people with different looks. Because if we feel and believe this to be true, it'll end up in our library. So Mel can create new labels, which will form new impressions, shown in red. Or there's a second R, replace. 
we can consciously create something that is the direct opposite of the labels we know. For example, chubby cheeks for innocence, or gap teeth as clumsiness, or problematic skin as unhygienic. By creating these conscious new labels, when Mel and Mo deliver their labels, the mind gets confused. Which label does it listen to? So that forces our mind to actually use more mental energy to actually create more authentic impressions. Pretty cool, right? The last R is remind. Sometimes we can't catch up to Mel and Mo in their label delivery system. So let's get busy. Let's create Noah the Nudge, a personalized reminder that translates a symbol on someone's face as the work we should try to do. For example, if we see someone for the first time, we can make their nose a symbol to renew or to replace. Not only so this system can work, but also so it can stay. Another thing that I forgot to mention about the three R's is that they're powerful and versatile. The power of the three R's can extend outside the confines of attractiveness and hack any negative outcome of a mental shortcut you wish to hack. So any negative stereotypes that target someone or a group because of their age, their gender, their sexual orientation, or their race can be hacked using this method. This is primarily because we promote more complex thinking, so authentic, genuine understanding. So by using this system, we not only change how we think and how we decide, but also we can inspire others to do it as well. So my camper from a few years ago, she's probably 14 right now and can be taught this method because one day they might end up being our leader, teacher, or manager. And I'm sure I wouldn't want them to judge me just on my looks and my labels. So for the Blue Pill group, I didn't forget about you. If you haven't converted to Team Red, that's all right. But remember, without taking this leap forward to try, we will remain frozen. Instead of asking ourselves, did I learn today? Did I grow today? Or did I inspire today? We'll be frozen on fixating on, how do I look? We will be frozen on evaluating people based on their looks and their labels and not so many important qualities. And most importantly, we will continue to be judged on our looks and our labels and not whether we have the skills to be a manager, the patience to be a teacher, or the compassion to be a leader. So now you have the three R's, renew, replace, and remind to help you to shape yourself to become more thoughtful and understanding when you meet someone for the first time. It's simple, but it's a big decision. It's a decision to conceal to survive or to change to thrive. Thank you.